What do I mean by music is too easy to make? Let's just go back to the 1940s and 50s. Frank Sinatra used to get up in front of an orchestra and sing a vocal take, and they had one microphone. And they would get it balanced just right. Frank would say, okay, I'm ready to do it, and he'd sing it. Come fly with me, let's float down to Peru. <laughs> Hey everybody, I'm Rick Beato. We're gonna try something new today. This video is on the history of the music business and technology in two acts. Act one. Music is too easy to make. What do I mean by music is too easy to make? Let's just go back to the 1940s and 50s. Frank Sinatra used to get up in front of an orchestra and sing a vocal take and they had one microphone and they would get it balanced just right. Frank would say, okay, I'm ready to do it, and he'd sing it. Come fly with me, let's float down to Peru. Then you get into the 1960s or so, and then you have things where you have multi-track machines. You could go in if you had a mistake in a vocal part or any instrument, and you do a punch in. Oh, I don't like that word. I sang it out of tune, or I want to change this lyric. You go in and you just punch in, fix the line, punch out. Fast forward to 1998 with Cher, the Believe song. They invented this thing, Auto-Tune, that I've talked about this a million times on here, but Auto-Tune was a plug-in that would go into these DAWs, Digital Audio Workstations. So you'd have something like Pro Tools or Logic or Ableton. What you do is you take the vocal, let's say the song's in C major. Any note in the key of C major, it would tune the note to. Well, T-Pain and people like that realized if you put it on a really hard tuning, it would make it sound like a keyboard. And that's what they did in the Believe song. Well, then the same thing starts happening with drum parts. Guys playing a drum part and you're like, you know what? This would be a great take of this first verse if this one hi-hat wasn't a little drag. Well, let's move it back a little bit or let's move it forward, whatever. And then you move that and you're like, well, the snare after it kind of sounds weird because we move that forward. Now the snare sounds like it's drag. So we do that. Then you're like, well, you know what? Let's just look at the grid lines, the bar lines. And we'll just move them to that. Then you start cutting out moving them. Then they give you this tool called Beat Detective. Then you can actually quantize an entire part. So then it becomes like a drum machine. So it's not human-like. Here's, Here's an example of a quantized drum part. It's John Bonham's drum performance from Fool in the Rain that's a shuffle. Here's what it sounds like as a machine. Now here's the actual human performance of John Bonham. Notice the swing in it. Once you've quantized the drum part, it's a drum machine. It's just like superior drums. So what started happening in the year 2000 or so is that everyone started quantizing their drums because the budgets to hire session guys like Josh Freeze and Kenny Aronoff went away and you'd have to use the crappy drummers. I mean, some bands would have good enough drummers to play, but you would typically have these crappy drummers that you'd have to fix their parts. And once you fix their parts, you start moving the bass around, you start moving the guitars around, and then you pretty much have sterile, generic, quantized rock music that has no vibe at all. This is, this is Spotify's way of using AI. They have AI songs, they attribute them to people that don't exist, and this allows them to take royalties that would go to musicians and keep them for themselves. On the AI front related to music is too easy to make, I made a video last week called, I told you this was gonna happen, and I played some songs off Udio, and I was saying how my kids could detect that they were AI songs, but other people could not. Well, it just came out, all three major labels are suing AI startups for copyright infringement. Universal Music Group, Sony Music, and Warner Music are suing Suno and Udio for copyright infringement because guess what? They're using all their music to train these AI models. Well, of course they are. How else are they going to train it? Now, companies like Universal are not doing it for the good of their music to protect their copyright owners. What's going on here is they just announced that they're partnering with a company called SoundLab to make AI models of their artists for themselves. They can use this SoundLab plugin in Pro Tools or Logic, and you can sing your own voice and replace it with one of their artists like Drake or Taylor Swift 
or Billie Eilish or whoever agrees to this. And I guarantee you all these labels are going to do that because they want to own the AI versions of these songs. Whether you create it or whether they create it, they're going to own it. Act two, music is too easy to consume. So this is the water faucet in my kitchen. But imagine this is streaming on Spotify or Apple Music. You can turn it on, you can turn it off, but what's going on in the stream of water is all of the music that's on these platforms. Now imagine this is one artist's entire output, their entire catalog might be the police, could be Billie Eilish, could be Led Zeppelin, the Beatles. And then this dropper is each of their songs. One, two, three, four. Oh, I just did a whole record there. And eventually you exhaust their whole catalog. When I hit this and I start the stream, the music has very little importance if you think about it this way. It goes from the faucet, down the drain, out to the sewer, where it's recycled again. Except in this case, the music is not recycled like it is through the sewer. There were 100,000 new songs added every day in 2023 to streaming platforms. That's more than one song per second for the entire year. By comparison, when I was a kid, if I wanted to buy this Led Zeppelin II record, I had to get a job or borrow money from my parents to buy it because I wanted to own it. I wanted it to be in my collection. This album here, Pat Metheny, New Chautauqua, I paid eight bucks for brand new with the money that I made by bagging groceries at Topps Grocery Store in Fairport, New York. You actually had to expend energy riding your bike or walking to your job, working your shift, getting your paycheck at the end of the week, depositing it in the bank, getting money out, going to the record store, buying the record, bringing it home, playing it, listening to it a bunch of times, going over to your friend's house, sharing it with them. When a kid opens Spotify and clicks on on a song, they can just skip to the next one if they don't like it. Think about this. All of the music that exists, or at least it's been uploaded to Spotify or Apple Music, is available for $10.99 a month. I'm talking about all of Michael Jackson's music, all of ACDC, Pink Floyd, Whitney Houston, Tupac, Kendrick Lamar, Juice World, Eminem, Dr. Dre, all the works of Beethoven, of Bach, of Mozart, of Stravinsky, of Shostakovich, of Charlie Parker, of John Coltrane, of Miles Davis, Brad Meldo, of Pat Metheny, Keith Jarrett, all of that. $10.99 a month for the price of what we used to pay for one album. It's all available on these streaming platforms, which is why music is not as valued by young people. There is no sweat equity put into obtaining it, having it be part of your collection, having it be part of your identity of who you are. These are the bands I believe in. These are the artists that I love and I'm gonna share it with my friends. I'm gonna bring that record to school. I'm gonna play it for my friends after school. We're all hanging out, reading the back cover of it and seeing who played on it. These things meant something. What was on here meant something. Produced by John Burns and Genesis. It was important. The tingles. Keep up.